My name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we're going to be talking specifically about pruning and feeding of, and we're just going to be working around these sweet Meyer lemon trees. There's three of them that are on this stretch of the property. We're going to be talking about with pruning the concept of espalier, um, or espalier, um, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And we're also going to be talking about the Ivory Organics products, which I've got here, our newest line, which is the blue line which is the oil-free products, and then we've got the original yellow line, which has um, got the seven natural oils in it, and the ready-to-use spray. But we're gonna be talking about all this towards the end. But before we start, um, let me first share with you that today's October 21st. It's like a record hot day, like it's surprisingly hot. Um, let's take a look here at the weather. If you take a look, right near here in Los Angeles at 9.41 a.m., it's already 93 degrees with an expected high of 103 degrees. Um, and take take a look, tomorrow's gonna be 97, and then it gets back down to what's supposed to be normal within the next week at the mid 70s. I've even brought here a chart to share with you what our weather conditions are supposed to be like here in October, where my finger is, if you go up, the average high is supposed to be 79 degrees, with November being about 73 average high, down to 68 in December. Um, and then here again, 66 in January, and then warming its way up going into spring and then ultimately summer. But this is an unusually hot, 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 late October month. Um, but with that being said, and let's not get into politics, let me give you the tour of these Meyer lemons. Um, check out all of these fruit. For those of you who've been following um, all of these videos on how we've been pruning them successively throughout the year, check out all of these fruit hanging so low and also right here we're gonna correct this like look my head's hitting and it's kind of annoying when you're entering the garden they've got all these fruits so we're gonna correct this without pruning so we're gonna be um, exploring that in just a minute and coming a little bit further around here come around yeah you can check out all of these lemons that are here and take a look here at this um, banner it's um, going to be of importance in just a minute. I'll explain to you why in a second. And then as you come around even further and further, you can see that the plant is completely overgrown. This is not ideal and it hasn't been ideal um, for at least the last 30 to 60 days. It's kind of pushed out a lot of new growth. Check out all of these honeybees that are pollinating and doing what they do best. Um, there's a whole bunch of new lemons in here. If you come in a little closer, you can check out all of these beautiful clusters of baby lemons as well and then within it all of these yellow lemons and then we've got some green lemons and there's just so much going on if there's one citrus tree that you're wanting to see a lot of activity happening on in your garden it's got to be in consider um, what's now called instead of just Meyer lemon the improved Meyer lemon is a virus free strain all these beautiful pollinators here in the garden so when it comes to the improved Meyer lemon variety, it's basically a virus-free strain of what was originally called simply the Meyer lemon. So when you go to your stores, you're gonna notice on the tags, they're gonna read improved Meyer lemon. And just check out how vigorous and healthy it is. And again, when it comes to a citrus tree, and here's the third one back here. So you can notice this one is growing a lot less, but no less productive. Check out all of these lemons under here. If I can pull this up. There's gotta be at least 20 right here behind my hand. They kind of look like grapes, how many lemons we've got. Keep. So we can attribute the reason that this plant is significantly shorter than the surrounding two Meyer lemons because this is probably supporting a lot more fruit, a lot more dense fruit, and thereby it's consuming a lot more energy towards fruit production rather than growth. And we have no problem with that. The height is nice, and we're gonna to try to manage these trees before the end of this video to kind of match all three of these Meyer lemons so they all look uniform. And we're gonna do that together right now. But before we do, check out these trees and believe it or not, and let me get back to the other side where you can see all the fruit. Oh, underneath the lemon. So here we are now on the other side of that Meyer lemon tree. Check out that cluster of lemons again that I basically explained kind of look like grapes with how cluster they are. Um, we're gonna thin all of those out. But all of these lemons, believe it or not, are less than two years old. 
I installed them less than two years, sometime um, in December to February of, um, like I said, about two years ago. And just to prove it to you, I'm gonna share this quick video link by Isabel Rose, our little red gardener, who's my oldest daughter, um, when she basically did a tour of these um, three lemons. Check this out. Hi, I'm Isabel Rose, the little red gardener. Let me show you my backyard. But first, I'm gonna say what we're gonna do today. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna pot trees, and and we're gonna and I'm gonna teach you about ivy organics. Welcome to my garden. Look at these beautiful lemons. That one, that one, and that one are all the same. And. So the first thing I want to share with you when it comes to training your trees, because not always do you have to prune it, you can um, notice that this branch over here, which if you come a little closer and then you can back back you know, into position, but you can see that we've got a whole bunch of little fruits. So this is the next generation of lemons that will be coming. And if this is a branch we want to keep, we can simply pull it down and train it in the down position as we've done with all of these you may notice some of the string if you come in a little closer you may notice over here all of this twine that's in place is to kind of steer and direct these branches into the down position and now check out all of these lemons that are alongside of our very short and low um, you know our very short fence if you come in a little closer now that we're here I want to I want to point out another fact as well you may notice over here, and I'm going to show the video where we um, pruned these fruit that were coming off of this branch. And then on this side as well, you can notice that we've pruned over here another cluster of fruit that were hanging off of this. And since we pruned it, you can see it's created these new branches, new flowers, and then ultimately all of these new fruit. Check all this out from what were two pruned branches about a year ago. Check this one out now. When harvesting your lemons, think about what is gonna be the next best growth areas. What are gonna be the next best bloom areas on those stems? Don't just simply cut all of those fruit off those stems. The right thing to do is to prune those branches back to where it's gonna to continue to grow and bloom and support more fruit in the years to come. And Here's, here's the point and here's the lessons I want to make here. You'll notice that when I made that last cut, I made a cut over here, which is leading to nowhere, nor are there any leaves or buds or anything coming off of it. The proper way and a more logical way would be to prune it back to where you see some leaves. And I'm actually going to cut this back all the way to right about here. And before I cut it, what I'm going to do is remove all of these leaves and all of these fruits and I'm going to encourage the plant to continue growing right at this point right here and I'm going to cut it at an angle right near and right underneath this leaf which has got a bud which will ultimately form the new branches to support the new flowers and we're just going to cut it like so and now we've got all of these additional lemons as well and then over here there's another bundle of lemons and I want these branches to all continue to grow and hang and, and support more fruit but I'm going to do the same thing with this bundle of lemons and just prune it like so, right here. And now what's gonna happen, and take a look at all of these lemons that we've got on just this one prune. And what we'll do when, when bringing them in the house is we're gonna now separate them like so. I'm just gonna cut it about a quarter of an inch right above. And this will be the perfect way to actually harvest your lemons and then store them. And you can keep them in a cool, dry place in your house um, for anywhere from 10 to up to 21 days. Um, so about two to three weeks, they'll store. But with all the rest of these lemons, take a look at how many more lemons we've still got in here. They'll remain on the plant for anywhere up to two to four months and still be in good quality condition on the plant. So when training a branch, all you simply need is your twine, got my scissors, and the main lesson when training your branches is to make sure you're not putting the knot against the branch. You're going to want to put the knot against the supporting stake or in this case the fence. So I'll move this bottle here out of the way and we're simply going to tie a knot here. 
so you can follow this. And then we're gonna basically capture the branch. We're gonna wrap it around. And then we're gonna go back and secure it in place. And now I've got this branch out of our walkway and where it can continue to support and create the fruit. So we've kind of created now what looks like a weeping effect um, by pruning, you know, by basically directing that branch down. The other concern I have here with these branches before we get to pruning is this one over here that's hitting my head. Um, it's kind of annoying and it's, and it's creating too much of a very narrow cave effect. I don't mind the, the fact that we've got, you know, a cave structure with, you know, underlying fruit, but it's just too low. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull this branch up and into position and what I did just before the video was I installed a stake that's right there in that position. So I'm gonna get over there and what I'm gonna do is do the same thing. I'm gonna tie my twine to the supporting stake and then grab the branch and pull it into position and it's basically gonna open this entire walkway um, as it pulls itself and the um, surrounding branches back with it. One thing we're also being very cautious and careful not to do is to create too much of a compact structure. I've invested the last couple of years creating an open canopy with basically pulling the branches apart in different directions to maximize the amount of light that gets onto each leaf that's on all of these different branches as the more leaves that are serving as just solar panels making the sugars and the vitamins and the proteins and all the minerals that go into creating the ultimately your fruit. But as the plant's making all of these resources, these leaves in order to function best need light. And to accomplish this, we're gonna to wanna to create as you know as open as possible of a canopy. But in this situation, we're pulling these branches back in, but we're doing so cautiously, still trying to keep in mind the open canopy policy. So let's get into supporting the tree now. So we just secured it with our twine. The first time, this branch is still not high enough. So we're now we're gonna do a second supporting um, support system. So here we go with a second. Doing more than one is also preferred as that's also going to minimize the stress upon the branch that we're not trying to redirect and resupport. So here we go again, going back behind the tree. And again, we're tying a knot against the stake, looping around the branch. Now we're gonna cap capture this branch and pull this branch back up in a position while this one is still offering support to the overall main structure of the branch. So here we go. Here we are again, we're wrapping. If you wanna come in a little closer so you can see what I'm, I'm looking for. I've got another fork in the road over here, some more forks in the branches over there. So we're just gonna wrap it. I'm gonna select right in between the two. That'll help keep that branch in the selected area. Now we're gonna throw this back into position. Now I'm gonna secure it, here we go. And watch the branch go right into position. Here we go. And that's it. And now we're tying the knot in place. And we're done. The branch is now out of the way. We still got these beautiful lemons in place and we did no pruning yet. Let's talk about pruning now. Follow me to the other side. So I'm glad again, I just wanna reiterate the fact, I'm glad we're doing a strictly Meyer lemon, which is a sweet lemon variety video to discuss how these plants are typically more compact growing than a lot of the other citrus varieties. These three lemons that are behind me are grafted on a standard rootstock. I brought this container plant over here being also an improved Meyer lemon variety that's grafted onto a dwarf fruit stock. 
This plant only grows a matter of inches per year, whereas as you can see, these trees behind me are growing several feet per year. On average, maybe as much as five to eight feet annually. This little thing um, has produced on average, unfortunately there's no lemons on it today, but it averages about three to five lemons per year on this teeny tiny plant. And we've used this in other videos in the past where you can see the fruit that were on it. Um, whereas these are producing, I would say close to 50 to 100 fruit per year with expected production to be in the hundreds of fruit per tree per year being just that it's a standard variety, meaning more branches, more height, and therefore more area to support more fruit. And again, such a beautiful tree and on this warm, um, October day, you can just smell the fragrance in this entire garden. It's truly mag magnificent. Um, what I want to share with you next is this concept of espalier, which I mentioned to you at the beginning. And whether you call it espalier, which I believe is a French word, or espalier, um, it's a horticultural and ancient agricultural practice of controlling woody plant growth for the production of fruit by pruning and tying branches to a frame. Plants are frequently shaped in a formal pattern, flat against structures such as a wall, fence, or trellis, and also plants which have been shaped in this way. And here you can see is a horizontal espalier where it's basically maybe something like an apple tree, you know, grown with branches running horizontally against a wall. Or I feel like what I've created here is something called a freestanding espalier fruit tree. And what what and the reason I'm saying it's a freestanding espalier is I'm trying to grow these Meyer lemons in a very dense and tight strip. Basically a rectangle shape against this growing area. And if I went with my shears and just pruned away, what I'd be doing is I'd be pruning away all of the flowers and fruits um, and basically preventing my success at having a maximum yield of fruit. You gotta be very selective in how you basically support the branches and also how you prune the branches. And we're gonna talk about pruning in just a minute. When we come to this Meyer lemon tree behind me, this one here was most susceptible to the risk of sunburn when we pruned it back in February. And again, I'm gonna put the video link to all of the Meyer lemon work we've done on these trees behind me um, at the end of this video. And I'll also put it in the comments down below so you can just click on all of these Meyer lemon videos if you wanna see a lot more. Um, but what we're gonna do here today is there's this open space and I'm hoping you can see this within the tree structure. Right down below is the tree trunk. You can see the branches that are coming up and off of it. They're coated in the ivory organic color white. It could also be done in colors brown and green, but we've selected white for this purpose. But it would be nice if this branch that were here, instead of it growing out into my courtyard, was in fact growing vertically up and filling this empty space that otherwise has no branches behind it. And the cool thing is we can accomplish that through training as we did on the other side of this um, Meyer lemon. We're gonna now basically support this branch to the stake that's behind it and create just that it is a branch in exactly the place we want. It'll be filling in another open space, maximizing on light thereby creating maximum amounts of sugars as well as the proteins, vitamins, and, um, and all the other minerals that the plants need for health. And that'll also maximize the amount of fruit production within this tree. So we're now going to steer and direct and control this branch. And keep in mind, once I support it, within about eight months to a year, that branch will be permanently in that position. If it's still too heavy with fruit, you might need to resupport it in a different manner. But otherwise, within the upcoming year to a few years, this branch will be in that position indefinitely. Let's go and support this branch now. So I found a place in here where I could squeeze. I'm now coming again with my twine. I'm simply gonna tie a knot. If you wanna come in a little closer, you can see how I tie the knot. And what I'm using are these metal stakes that are covered in um, this plastic vinyl material. You can see the metal that's right up in here, covered in this plastic um, vinyl material. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna simply put the knot against it and then I like wrapping it one more time and then doing two more double knots. And that'll hold the twine in the position that I want it to stay. And that's it, that won't slip up nor down. And now I'm gonna grab that branch that I wanna secure. It's right here. I'm gonna wrap it. And I'm gonna try to get it in the most vertical position possible, which is right here. I may even put a second um, support on it as well as we did on the first to make sure that it's supported in more than one position. 
so it's not too stressed in the position that we're trying to control. And that's it. Let's go on to another lesson. So over here is another branch, which I could also train into this position. And take a look at all of those lemons. It's gonna be such a showcase um, branch. And it's also, again, occupying an area that's not being used by a branch. And again, capitalizing on light and maximizing fruit production. And it's all within this very tight growing zone. All of these other branches that are growing loosely into my growing zone and which if I pulled it back, would be basically going into the shade of another branch, we're gonna have to prune. The hardest one for me to correct that I just don't see right here is gonna be this branch over here. And you can see this poor honeybee that's working hard, um, collecting the sugars out of the flowers. But if I were to pull this branch up, take a look. I'm going right into the under canopy of a branch that's right above it. This is a branch that's gonna have to come out. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow this branch back I'm hoping if you can come in a little closer, I found this perfect place for pruning it would be right here. Take a look at all of these fruit that are here underlying. We come up, you can see a branch that's coming out as well. We got some more flowers that'll be, um, and this one will become dozens within the upcoming month or two if it keeps on blooming the way it has. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna prune it right here. And I'm gonna explain to you why in just a second. So we're just gonna prune it like so. And what we've done now is this area and this branch, once it expands and grows, will eventually heal over and, and close over this wound. We're also gonna seal it with the Ivory Organics products in just a minute, but we're gonna continue this pattern throughout. If there isn't a branch existing, we can simply go down to the next nearest leaf, and basically I'm pruning it about a quarter inch above that leaf, and then this leaf node will eventually turn into another bud that'll create the next branch. And hopefully it'll happen not from one, but maybe two or three leaves, and we'll create a, a nice bushy compact system that'll then fill in this growing zone. And we're gonna continue this pattern going all the way down. So here we are now. Take a quick look at this entire length. You can see I've cleaned it up a lot. Check out all the branches we've removed. This is the end of October. This is now at least my third, if not fourth time this year that have significantly pruned my Meyer lemon trees. Um, and again, you can see a lot of those videos at the end. Um, the um, person behind the camera was asking, well, how about this branch that's you know near the bottom? Let me share with you what's going on here. Check out these little fruit, and these have completely held its position. So these will definitely turn into fruit. Here's some more flowers and more fruit on its way. And here you can see much larger fruit that'll be ripe within the upcoming month or two. But if these were to support its fruit as it's been doing, we're gonna have fruit that's touching the ground. Chances are with winter and rain and the moisture and mildew that's gonna be collecting near the floor, it's gonna damage these fruit significantly. It is in your best interest to clean that up and to prevent that risk from happening. Otherwise, you're gonna have very unpleasant, one, to look at, or two, they may potentially not even ripen well at all to begin with because they're touching the ground. A small sacrifice, but all that energy that you're taking away from this zone will go into a zone that you in fact, you know, want and, and you know, and, and can appreciate and that won't be at risk at rubbing against the floor, won't be at risk of, you know, snails and slugs and other pests near the ground that may be chewing on your fruit. Um, so great pest control, you know, way. And also by keeping your plant off the ground, it's gonna minimize also the risk of more pests entering the plant. So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna prune this branch. And again, if you wanna come in a little closer, um, I'm just gonna prune this branch back like so, back to these leaves. And then this larger branch, I'm just gonna follow this cluster of lemons that are underneath and hopefully create another cluster of branches and flowers off of this stem over here. So I've allowed a stem to exist that'll be hopefully the future cluster of flowers and fruits again in the future. But this here is gone. And there's one more branch that's back here, which is, this is a poor growing branch. You can see over here, I've got another branch structure that's over here. The branch on this side is growing into the tree. The goal when it comes to the structure of the plant, I'm just gonna hold my hands and my fingers out as far as I can. The goal is you wanna start from the middle and basically have all the branches growing in the out direction. What is happening here is the branch is growing back into the tree. And even though this has medium sized fruit on it, check this out. 
one, two, three, four, five, I'll squeeze what I can out of it and make a nice citrus drink or a marinade or a salad dressing or something out of it. None of this will go to waste, but this branch is not in an ideal situation and potentially harming the underlying structure and other branches that are in there doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is growing from the inside out. So this branch as well, which is growing into the canopy, will be pruned out as well. And again, with the prune, we're gonna come in as close as we can to the, um, the branch, prune like so, and carefully remove that branch from the structure. And here we are, here we are. we're pretty much done. I hope you guys like that. So here we are now back in the, um, on one side of our Meyer lemons. As you can see, the whole walkway has now opened up. So if you take a look here, as we um, explained at the beginning, we've got these products I wanna share with you real quick, and we're gonna start using one right, right away. Um, the first one is this blue line, and then the second being the original and the yellow line, and then the ready-to-use spray bottle, which is here the three-in-one plant guard ready-to-use spray protection against damaging sunburned insects and rodents, is derived as a ready-to-use spray bottle from this product over here. Um, as you can see, it's also registered material for use in organic agriculture. And the way it works is the inert ingredients are iron oxide, which controls the color, limestone, mica, which is about a, like a clay base, milk and silica combined when applied to your plants will last for about a year. The magic behind the yellow label are the seven natural garden oils, which include castor oil, cinnamon, clove, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, spearmint um, oils. And what these will do is once brushed onto your tree trunks, as you can see with all of these lemons behind me that are coated in white, also available in colors brown and green for both the whitewash product as well as the three in one, will offer protection one with the yellow label when applied, apl you know, uh, offers protection against the rodents, but also on your pruned branches, which we're gonna see in a minute, it'll help keep any borers from entering, such as beetles and termites, but also when sprayed on your leaves as a foliar spray, and you can use any of these cans to also create a foliar spray, will help keep your plants several degrees cooler in the summer, but also insulate your plants from freezing, damage, you know, damaging winter temperatures as well. And lastly, the products can also be used as a dormant spray as well to basically smother insects that are living within your peaches, nut trees, and even ornamentals. Um, so let's take a look at how we're gonna apply that product if you wanna follow me over here. So if you take a look at now this citrus, you can see that the light is now coming through. If you can come in a little closer, I'm hoping you can see, and I'll try to pinpoint it from the other side. We can see here is a branch that we once pruned in the past. This branch would have been offering more support, more leaves, more fruit, and also shading this understory of the um, of this Meyer lemon. What we're going to do today, and we've already done this about a year ago now, but we can continue again today with taking our brush and simply recoating that pruned branch. We're also coating the entire stem as well. The goal is is to keep the stems cool from the risk of sunburn. There's risk pretty much on all fruit trees, all nut trees, all ornamentals, roses and shrubs could benefit from being whitewashed. And if you go to the ivoryorganics.com website, you can find some PDFs which talk about the university studies that substantiate the benefits of protecting your trees at the time of installation, as well as management as the plants get older, especially around times of pruning. So you can see we're now cooling this entire structure from overexposure of too much sun, whether it be summer sun or also known as winter sun scald at the other extreme of the year. Um, we're gonna carefully continue this brushing on process um, down the rest of the tree. Let me now share with you the whitewash product if you go back to where we started. So again, the differences between the products, if you open your can of the yellow product, you're gonna find that base that exists as well as those seven natural garden oils that are bubble wrapped. If we take off the bubbles, you can see here's your vial with the oils that are in there, the seven natural garden oils. The difference between this and now your blue label, if we open up the blue label, you're gonna see that it comes with your bag of powder, but what the blue label also includes instead of the oil, as you can see there's no oil in here, but what it has instead is it has the added active ingredients of garlic powder and cinnamon powder. So within this bag, you've also still got some protection from um, some pests as well with the benefits of garlic and cinnamon, but 
The product is being sold as a whitewash protection against damaging summer sunburn and winter sun scald. A product that can be used again as a brush on, as well as a foliar spray, as well as a tree paste, depending on how much water you add to the product. I want to share these brochures with you as well. Um, and there's a lot of PDFs you can now find as well at, at ivoryorganics.com. If you come in a little closer when we open it up here, these here are our banners that we'll typically find at um, conventions and expos that we attend. The first one being over here, you can see that the Ivory Organics has a protection um, from sunblock protection or a sunscreen protection. Protection against summer sunburn, winter sun. It's called premature blooms. Functions as an anti-transparent um, at time of planting. There could be value with that. Prune trees and plants. Um, as an insect propellant on your pruned trees, as we just discussed with the exposed surfaces, you want, might want to seal those damaged bark bulbs by coating them. You also protect them from insects as well as rodents. Um, and then over here with the rodent repellent protection, you've got protection from girdling trees. There's your bulbs again. And all of these function as a time release uh, protection as well. We just talked about these two products and this here is the ready to use spray. When you install a plant or if you expect a heat wave that's gonna stress out your plants, um, not that we're concerned about these now very well established plants, but on our new tender growth, and I don't really see much behind me that's, um, that's a new growth within the last month, but I could otherwise spray it. I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. If you come in a little closer, I can even spray the fruit. And now I've created basically an organic sunblock spray, as you can see with that light film that's accumulating over here. But it's doing that same thing on the entire leaf and throughout that entire area that I've sprayed now with the Ivory Organics Protection from the extreme summer heat, as well as this product having those oils will naturally repel insects and, and other critters from damaging those tender young leaves as well. So let's talk about feeding now. Here we are now, again in October. So we're basically in the middle of fall, approaching winter. And um, before I explain this lesson, there's a lesson we learned from Tom, Tom Spellman at a lecture I attended earlier this year, who um, works with Dave Wilson Nursery, which is one of the largest distributor of bare root fruit trees in this country. Um, what he said is the feeding cycle of trees is analogous to the 24 hour day for the person. When you wake up, many of us skip breakfast, but it's recommended that you have some food. So you basically eat something for breakfast so you're not starving before lunch. For lunchtime, a lot of the medical professionals will recommend that you have as much as you can to eat. Not as much, but it's supposed to be the main meal for the day is your lunch meal with dinner being, again, a sensible light dinner before you go to sleep and basically hibernate for, I'm going to call it nighttime and your sleeping time, winter. Similarly, when you wake up, that's spring for the plant. You gotta feed your plants something to make sure all of the elements and minerals and nutrients are there for the plant so that the plants can achieve maximum success as you can see with these trees behind me. So in the spring, you feed your plants but you feed them lightly. In the summer, that's the plant's lunch. Make it big. Follow the directions and give them basically the maximum recommended dose of fertilizer. And again, make sure you're doing things all organically. Um, when you go to feed your plants, the plants in, in summertime are at their maximum metabolism rate and thereby by giving them all of these nutrients and, 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 and fertilizers, they're basically going to consume them quickly and readily. Again, I recommend using, using a granular over a liquid as it's going to be available to the plants much longer than a liquid feed unless you've got the time and the energy to keep on applying these liquid feeds. And one other lesson when it comes to feeding your plants is by using multiple different types of organic fertilizers, you're going to be able to get more minerals and nutrients to the plants than maybe just one brand with those specific ingredients that are in there. So consider also crossing some organic fertilizers as well into your garden. Um, so now we talked about spring being light, summer being a heavier feed, fall being again a lighter, your dinner, um, a lighter meal for your plants, and then winter you do nothing. You do not feed your plants in the winter. For those of us here in Southern California, um, you can follow the schedule, but for those of you that are living in more cooler climates, such as New Jersey, New York, um, and even northern parts of California, Oregon, and Washington, um, it may be too cold right now. Add a your organic fertilizer to the soil, your soil biology is, is going into dormancy and it is not going to be able to metabolize those organic fertilizers into the elements and the fuel to ultimately feed the plants. And again, you don't want your plants growing and performing prematurely as well. If I go and I feed my plants, it's going to push another flush of growth. And again, if we're going to have like freezing temperatures or really harsh weather coming up, 
or winter temperatures, you're not going to want them to be performing anymore. You're going to want them to harden and get strong for the winter and then get ready for a good spring, summer, and fall. Here's a chart just to summarize exactly what I just said. When it comes to fertilizing or feeding your plants by season and the winter starts, you know, basically slow to nothing, in spring you're going to want to warm up. In the summer, that's going to be your maximum amount of food, so follow your labels and give them the most. Typically in the fall and the spring, I'm giving much less than the recommended dose. And here's winter. For those of you, again, in other parts of the country, you might not be feeding at all come fall. Maybe all of your feeding is just going to be spring and summer, and then just let your plants go into dormancy fall through winter. But over here, we're going to be feeding our plants, and I've got below me um, some organic fertilizers that we're going to talk about. What I brought over here is a product made by Espoma, another one by miracle Grow. that's organic as well. Um, here's another one made by E.B. Stone, a third one here made by Eco Scraps. And then I've got a couple of chemical fertilizers. The difference between, and I'm gonna put this line here to separate the good from the chemical, is that the good fertilizers basically are made out of blood meal and bone meal and um, feather meal. And you, if you take a look at the directions or the um, derived from that are on all of these labels, you'll see that they're derived from organic sources. If you take a look at these, you're gonna see that they're made by chemical sources such as this. You can see it's like a glow in the dark red. That's not made out of blood and bones and, and, um, and feathers. This is a chemically derived um, source. And the reason I've got miracle Grow over here and miracle Grow over here is miracle Grow also has an organic line of fertilizers that you can also find in your garden centers. But what we're gonna try to do is do something that's pretty balanced. Here, here's basically a nice balanced 555 meaning 5% nitrogen, 5% phosphorus, 5% potassium. Here's another one made by Espoma, Espoma specific for citrus. And the percentages on here, if you take a look a little smaller, is a 526. So 5% nitrogen, 2% phosphorus, 6% potassium. Um, we can use, like I said, a combination of fertilizers to basically get the maximum amount of nutrients and from more sources to maximize on the elements that are available to your plants. What we're gonna do when feeding the plants, if we can come in down to the under canopy of the, of the plant, what we're gonna do here is we're going to lightly feed. I'm just gonna take my hands on one of these fertilizers. I'll start off with the eco scraps. And again, I can put a couple layers. And keep in mind, based on that chart, I'm not following the directions. If the directions read, and this is without reading it, if it says, you know, one cup per foot, you know, of plant height, I'm basically gonna cut that down to about a fraction, whether it be one fourth or even one half of the recommended amount being we're right into the middle of fall and we're just gonna wanna make sure that we've got the elements into the ground and the plants are gonna absorb it and basically maximize its output come spring of next year. But what we're gonna do is just scatter some of this fertilizer around the root zone of the tree. So I probably, you know, just put a couple of handfuls and again, no big deal if you even wanna mix it and again the purpose of using a granular fertilizer is this is going to break down over the next two to three months this will feed the earthworms that are in the ground this here is going to feed the beneficial bacteria the beneficial nematodes the beneficial fungus um, and all of the good things that live here in the soil i want to point out another thing too you can see naturally there's a lot of leaves that are coming down to the ground this is fantastic news as these leaves are going to come down it's part of the decay process and that's also enriching the soil what we're gonna do next is we're gonna add a few handfuls of compost. By doing this, we're also gonna be further enriching the top layer in the top soil. We're just gonna add about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. This here is gonna further activate those organic fertilizers and enrich and improve the soil condition. So we're just gonna to toss that in like so. And you can see, I haven't made a thick layer. You've got to be very cautious and keep in mind that that top 18 inches of soil is where 90% of the life of the tree is. That's where most of the soil biology is. That's where most of the air roots are. That's where most of the roots are grabbing all of the nutrients, the minerals that it needs for success. What we're going to do once we've done just that, we've added the fertilizer and some compost to the soil, we're just going to mix that top quarter inch of soil, eighth of an inch of soil. We're going to be very careful not to disrupt the, the surface roots and we're just gonna mix that and level it out, like so. And the last thing we're gonna do, we're gonna help retain moisture by adding some more wood chips to the base as well. So we're gonna do that. 
all around the tree. And the goal is to add about a two to four inch layer of wood chips. We're being very careful not to make sure these wood chips come in contact with the bark. If it does, the wood chips are gonna absorb moisture. That moisture is gonna translate into the stem and cause stem rot to your tree. So make sure you stay about two to four inches away from the stem of the tree. And here's the cool thing. We're gonna take those branches that we pruned earlier today and we're gonna recycle these as well. All of the minerals and elements that went into creating these branches going right back into the soil biology and it's going to work its way right into those trees as well. Let's enjoy that. Let's enjoy that scent one more time before we recycle it. Once that's done, your last and final step is water. Make sure when you're watering, you soak the area. By watering your plants, you activate all the fertilizers, you activate all of the life that's in your soil and the biology begins with water. When watering, and I'm talking about specifically here in the Los Angeles and Southern California area, on average when it comes to your citrus trees and most trees in general, you're gonna wanna water them and not water them again until the soil is dry but never bone dry. That's like the general principle. To accomplish this, on average for your in-ground plantings, that would be in the spring and fall, on average waterings deep waterings, we're talking about watering the entire root ball. This can take several minutes to soak, not just the top inch of soil, but all of the feet that surround that root ball. You're gonna to wanna to get two to three feet deep um, with your soaking. You can see the water is now starting to accumulate around the tree, um, the tree base. Um, but in the spring and fall, that would translate to here in Southern California to being waterings once a week to once every other week, spring and fall again. Summertime could be once a week and maybe as much as two waterings per week depending on the severity of, of, you know, of, of the temperatures. If you're having 100 degree days, that may justify two waterings in the same week. In the winter, just follow your climate. If it's not raining that month, you may need to water one time that month. I'm just not gonna finish the watering over here. So we're gonna repeat these steps of feeding and composting and mulching around each of these individual Meyer lemon trees. If you so let's do a quick comparison between these two fruit. If you come in a little closer, you can see here that I've got on this side of my knife, two of the Meyer lemons, and, if, and on this side of the knife are two Eureka lemons. Come in a little closer so you can see the textures of the two of them. And then I'm gonna cut them also in half. I'll go with the one that's a little more yellow so you can see what this looks like. So you can see what the inside of that looks like compared to, let's do now the Meyer lemon. And what you're gonna notice right off the bat, aside from the difference in color, you'll notice that the Eureka lemon for one is more yellow. The Meyer lemon is more yellow orangish and I'll explain to you in a minute and secondly the Eureka lemon as well as the Lisbon lemon has a thicker rind the Meyer lemon very very thin and when it comes to juice it's significantly more juicy check out all of that juice that's coming out compared to now we'll do the this one here looks a little less seedy on that side but here's the Eureka lemon also juicy but I would say it's about one third maybe one half the juice content that came out of that Meyer lemon. Um, and again, on a 100 degree day, that's awesome. When it comes to these two lemons, the Eureka lemon is the traditional store-bought lemon. The Meyer lemon, on the other hand, is a cross. Most research and scientists believe it's a cross between the mandarin orange. So imagine the sweetness of that orange into a lemon. And that's what you get with the Meyer lemon. So if you're looking for something sweet, which is great for your salad dressings, it's great if your goal is lemonade, uh, and it's great in a variety of things, including marinades. In fact, there's a grower I've learned about in, in Beverly Hills, just about seven miles away from where we're situated, that has about an acre to a half an acre of land where he's planted rows and rows and rows of these Meyer lemons. And Meyer lemons, it's another reason why you should have these in your gardens 
And even if you're anywhere throughout the world, including my friend Al, who's in Canton, freezing Illinois in the winter, where he's bringing his citrus pots indoors for the winter, he too is enjoying fruits such as these Meyer lemons indoors, um, where he protects them from, you know, in the winter, from the winter freeze, then brings them out come spring, summer, and fall. Um, to enjoy these lemons that you otherwise cannot find at the stores. And the grower in Beverly Hills is growing and supplying to all the local stores and restaurants in the area because again, you can't find them and if you're looking for something like this, they just don't transport well being that their skin is so thin. Um, so there's a high demand for the Meyer lemons and if you're looking for that sweet lemon in your garden, seriously consider the Meyer lemon um, tree for your garden. So I'm here with Isabel, who's going to be doing the conclusion for us. I hope you enjoy this educational moment with Ivy Organics. Be sure to like and most importantly subscribe down below to be connected to all of my other educational moments. Wait. Thanks again for watching. Awesome and happy gardening. Happy gardening. So here we are with Isabel, who's going to help us out with the conclusion. I hope you enjoy this educational moment with Ivy Organics. Be sure to like it and most importantly subscribe down below to be connected to all of my other educational moments. Thanks again for watching. And happy gardening. And happy gardening. So here I am with Isabel and Victoria who are going to help us with the conclusion. Isabel. I hope you enjoyed this educational moment with Ivy Organics. Be sure to like it and most importantly subscribe down below to, to be connected to all of our other educational moments with Ivy Organics. Thank Thanks you again, again for watching, watching and happy, and happy gardening. gardening.